you my friend hey how you doing i'm doing all right it's unusually like california hot in london today so i've been out and i feel like you know when you're out in the sun and then you just feel all sluggish towards the end of the day so you've just got to retire to the indoors hydrate play it safe <laughs> well too much sun is not a big worry over there so well you got to get it while you can right you'll be okay yeah exactly <laughs> So I was trying to recall the series of events that led us to us chatting today, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be talking with you finally. Um, I usually like to do these face-to-face, obviously with the current situation. I've been doing them over the phone. Some have worked better than others. Obviously, it's, it's a lot easier to try and like connect with someone and, and vibe off them when you're in a room with them. But I feel like there's a little bit of a rapport already established, and it was funny because I guess you guys played the Underworld probably around this time last year, because it was around the Rebellion Festival period in the calendar, wasn't it? And you had your own show in Camden. Well, yeah, and you and me were supposed to do an interview, and right before the show at the time, somebody came up to me and started doing an interview, so I assumed (laughs) it was you. And I did this whole interview with the guy, and then I heard from you, and I was like, hey, what happened? I didn't I didn't see you, and I was like, shit. I, fucking, I, I, I thought we did this. It was that so, kid's lucky uh, day. I mean, because I was with Charlie Renton, who I know you know, and we, right. were, we were having some drinks at the pub, and she was like, oh, we'll walk in now. And as we were walking in, I saw you doing that interview with that kid, and I was like, oh, I won't you know, interrupt the interview, and we sort of all said hello. And, and then, yeah, like whoever he was, wherever he came from, <laughs> he hit the jackpot that day. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're going to get a better interview now, Matt, because I've only gotten better in time. Hell yeah. Well, me too, because, you know, if you're not getting better, you're either getting worse or you're just stagnant and, and you're not progressing and, and what you're doing. And that kind of, without shoehorning in too much of like a crass segue, that kind of summarizes <laughs> your career perfectly. Um, you posted uh, like a, re, a repost of a comment on your Instagram today or last night from a guy called David Del. Oh, that. Del was, Val. I'm, I'm going to read it now. Thing. I'm going to read yeah. it now. He says, you know, this goddamn record is going to be great. No one except for Blag in the entire history of rock and roll puts out exceptional records 30 plus years after their first record. No one except Blag. Most bands are putting out garbage five years after their first and best. Then they tour that exclusively, but not Blag. He puts out the greatest rock and roll records there ever were. And then five years later, he puts out one that's even better than the last. And I read that and you, you know, you replied and said the Dwarves is a group effort, but you know, thank you. Lovely, lovely words. And it is a rarity, especially in the punk world, to continue to better yourself and to continue to push the envelope and experiment and and be progressive, be fresh and be good. Like it is a rarity and it's something that you guys have always done and done so well. And it must mean a lot when people like that guy, David, notice that and point it out. Oh yeah. I mean, it means everything, you know, because so, so much in music is just, you know, it's hype and it's marketing and it's bullshit. Right. So, you know, when somebody actually recognizes a lifetime commitment to making cool records, you know, and I think the other thing is that, you know, it's a little bit of a deserved call out for these old bands who don't try anymore. And he pretty much describes it dead on, you know, I mean, I don't want to shit on anybody, but it's like, I've spent my whole career watching other guys, you know, uh, who, who, who've given up, Uh, 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 you know, and it's like, it's kind of crazy, you know, because it's one thing, it's one thing when like you got your band and it's kind of an underground thing and maybe some cool people know about it, but a lot of people don't know about it or, or whatever. And then you'll see, you know, other people, pop musicians or, or other punk musicians or whatever, you know, that, that are, that are doing real well and are bigger than you. And you'll think, Oh, well, you know, that, that guy's got a cool audience, you know, that woman's got a great audience. So they, you know, people 
people are responding to what they're doing. But when it bums me out is when it's like, you made one cool record in 1985 yeah. and everybody bought it then. And now 35 years later, your dumb ass is still playing on the same fucking record and you never made another good one. and You never even considered it. And yet, you know, you're headlining over the dwarves at your festival and you're doing whatever, it, 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 you know, that shit happens even with great bands and even with bands that I really admire. You know, a, co- a couple of years ago, the Burger Boogaloo had happened with the Damned. You know, my whole life I've loved the Damned and thought they were a great band and thought they they had variety in there and they would make a good record and then later they'd make a different one. I, I always loved them. And, 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 you know, I was even uh, real friendly with their, uh, you know, their drummer who'd been in there for years. Uh, uh, and then, you know, I, I find out that it's that like UK bullshit thing. You know, we, we were supposed to play before them at a festival and then, you know, they had their management and their agent and everybody get in there and say, no, nah, we don't want the dwarves to play right before us. And, and they made some excuse, but it was just obvious, like, oh, you know, even though we're old, you feel like you're going to look old and tired if you fucking have us play before you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and people are still, you know what I mean? And it's like, but in a perverse way, that made me feel good because it was like, okay, you're just admitting that you, you're going through the motions and you're not that good anymore. And, and and we're still great, you know, and it doesn't matter if you're more famous, you sold more records and more people love you. All that matters is today in rock and roll. You know, do you have the nuts to play today? Are you good today? Did you keep being good today? You know, the, it, 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 you know it's like Outcast said, you know, you're, you're only as funky as your last joint, right? Yeah, these man. Punk bands are, these punk bands are fucking lame and they don't try and they've given up and it's just like, well, we want to sell some t-shirts and make some money. And yeah, you know, it's just when I get a comment like that from a, from, from a dwarves fan, you know, it just lets me know that there are people that recognize like, yeah, we keep trying, you know what I mean? We'll, we'll, we'll keep fucking making something great. And if we can't make something great, we just won't make anything. You know, you've done that as well. You know, you've had intermittent time periods off that have been, you know, blocks of a few years at a time. You've always been consistent, but there have been breaks and there have been gaps and you don't just release music for the sake of it. And I can also tell from listening to all your records, even though there's never been a big label or marketing campaign or budget behind your band, I can tell that you take real care over the production of the work and you don't put out anything that you feel clearly is less than like a hundred percent valid. Well, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's true. And, 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 you know, I, I think, I think the other thing that people kind of don't get, like you can't put out your record with a disclaimer that says, you know, Hey, you know how most of the records you listen to people spent a hundred thousand dollars on, but this one, uh, you know, there's only 5,000 in it, but still it sounds good. Like you can't, you can't put a disclaimer like that on your record. Like either your record sounds good or it doesn't, you know? So it's like, I think another thing people kind of don't get about the dwarves is that, you know, you'd have these half-assed punk bands that were popular at labels literally spending, I mean, in the nineties a million bucks to make a punk record that didn't sound as good as the record that we spent 10 grand on. How do you achieve that, Black? Because it is noticeable. Like, obviously, you've got those early records, which were a bit more scrappy, but every band has them. Yeah. But you get these albums, you yeah. know, I mean, the the Dwarves are Young and Good Looking is a classic case in point. Like, and I heard you saying in another interview that you couldn't give that album away to, a you know, another label at the time. You went to, like, Nitro, Hellcat, Fat, Epitaph, first time around, all these labels. The record's there. It sounds amazing, and you literally can't give it away. But how do you achieve a sound that is that rich and that glossy with zero budget? How do you make that happen? <laughs> That's a great question, Matt. I, I, I'm so glad we did this interview because people rarely ask me that. Like usually they'll ask me, like, "Hey, what what was it like when you when you you know took all your clothes off or what happened?" <laughs> oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Whatever you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fascinating me about you though because i was introduced to you guys through probably either i will deny you or i'm in love with everybody's girl one of those two songs was on one of those early uh punkorama compilations and it sounded and e- right. even everything that followed some 41 blink 182 all these like monster pop punk bands that followed they still haven't 
to this day put out anything that sounds as well produced and as well written and as well executed as that so when you're there and you can't get arrested you've got no budget how do you produce something that does sound so high end so yeah i mean there's several parts to it and and yeah this is for the heads right so first of all just anger you know i'm a guy in my mid-20s that gets fucked over by sub pop and you know it's like no i'm coming back i'm making a fucking record Secondly, it's just, you know, um, the, the idea of, you know, pop punk was in the air at that time. And it was one of the only times, I mean, remember the doors were a sixties garage band in the eighties when nobody cared about that. Right. And then we were a hardcore band in the late eighties when nobody cared about that. And, and then, you know, during the grunge era, we're a hardcore band and people are going, who cares? You know, we're standing, we're, we're on bills with Nirvana and shit like this. And people know that we're, um, you know, people know that we're a great band if they're came from the punk scene, but you know, it was just always wrong place, wrong time. When, when pop punk became big, when Green Day and Offspring got big, I said, fuck, this is a genre that I know and I can do and that we've dabbled in, you know, so so part of it is just the time frame, right? Yeah. And then, you know, in terms of the factors, it's like I had some great players, you know. I had I had Nick Oliveri on bass, you know. I had I had uh, you know Vaj Moore is a very consistent drummer. He doesn't get a lot of credit, but then there was you know uh, uh, Holy Smokes, who was a really cool guitar player, and he sort of added a little bit of a heavy metal element to us that most punk bands didn't have. Usually if you had like a Ramones punk song going, guys just strum on it yeah. and he had a way of picking at it more like it was like a, a metal, you know, that's that speed metal style, right? So 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 that sort of sets the table. And then, you know, I I had been hanging out with a guy that I know people appreciate in England. I don't know how many people appreciate him here, but there was a band called Material Issue from from Chicago. And uh, uh, he wrote a, a song called International Pop Overthrow, which they made a big festival out of and stuff like that. Anyway, this guy very unfortunately committed suicide in the mid 90s. But before he did, you know, we would sit around and party a lot. And he had a big major label deal. I didn't have anything. And he just, you know, man, we would talk about songwriting, you know, and he, and he got me thinking about things. And at one point he said, you know, you should do a song with girls' names in it, right? And they, they had a bunch of hits, like, um, you know, Renee remains the same, and, and Valerie loves me, and all these songs with girls' names. And I was like, that's a stupid idea. That's your <laughs> shtick. It's not me. You know, it's ne ne never going to work, blah, blah. Two weeks later, I write Everybody's Girl, which is just a bunch of girls' names, right? And I call him up, and I go, dude, this is the best song ever, ever I've ever written. Thank you, you know, and, and like, you know, within a couple of months, he was dead. So uh, that was that was kind of unfortunate. But, you know, it was basically like people thinking about songwriting, people angry, good players that kind of set the table for it. Then I go into the studio and I'm just looking for a place that has a Neve board, you know, because the Neve boards were kind of disappearing at that point for FSLs. Everybody wanted automation and stuff. And, and uh so I look for a place with a Neve board and I happen to sit down next to a guy that turns out to be Eric Valentine. And I realize like, oh shit, this guy's a fucking genius. And so that's a big reason why young and good looking like is this quantum leap because Eric went on to be a huge producer doing big pans of the time, you know, smash mouth, third eye blind and all this kind of shit. But at the time he was just a guy with a studio and I stumbled in there but I was smart enough to realize how good he was and how good his stuff sounded. And I was like, fuck man, this is like, if I can plug punk rock into this kind of production, we really got something here. And yeah, for my money, <laughs> even when you go back and you listen to a lot of great records of the era, you know, records like Dookie or smash, you know, they, they, they still don't have that sort of pop sound because, I had a radio guy. I had a guy with his ear to the radio going, what, you know, what does shit sound like that's not punk? What does shit sound like that's like hits on the radio? And I think if you plug that into a punk aesthetic, you can get something really cool, you know? And so that's part of the explanation. And then in the process, I spent several years with him. And we made Come Clean. By the time it was all over, he was very rich and famous. I was still the guy from the tours. 
but I knew how to produce records. I knew how to think about records. I knew how to think about them from the ground up. And I think most people that produce punk records, it's just more like, hey, I'm a cool guy. I got a studio. Come on in. We'll start thinking about this the day you walk in. And, you know, we'll record this best we can. And then here's our punk record. And if they spend more money, it's just sort of adding shit to shit, you know. Whereas I, I know how to make a record from the ground up. And that makes things different, you know, and you, you, you can get some better outcomes, you know. So anyway, that's the long winded kind of story of how the dwarves make amazing records with no money. <laughs> we take our time. We do it right. We have really talented people. And also guys like Eric Valentine or like drummers like Josh Freeze or different people over the years have heard the dwarves and said, whoa, you know, I admire this. So even though. You know, Josh will be working with Sting and Nine Inch Nails. You know, he'll still make a Dwarves record just because he likes my music, you know. So it, it's been very gratifying in a way. And then it's been very frustrating. You know, it's gratifying all my friends and all the cool people that help me make great stuff. And it's frustrating when, you know, assholes in the music industry have no imagination and don't know what sounds good and don't care, you know. And, and when fans are like, oh, I just, I like these guys from 1985 and that's about it, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. Well, you, you hit on a couple of things there that I'd love to get into more. One of them is you've been surrounded by such, you know, virtuoso, incredible talents that have, as you said, gone on to kind of conquer the world in their respective crafts, but they've remained loyal and connected to the dwarves and to you. Now, We'll get into the kind of perhaps the more success that your band should have, could have, would have had, you know, perhaps if things have played out differently. But it's it's a real testament to you as a creative and obviously as like a human that those people have stuck around and continue to want to like collaborate with you and be around you. And you must be aware of that. And that must be a really cool feeling to know that, you know, you're only as good as the company you keep. Right. And when it comes to your camp, like you're surrounded by the best of the best. Well, yeah, man. I mean, that's, you know, well said, you know, not, not just the rank and file guys of the dwarves were great from the beginning. I mean, guys like Saul Peter, he's been my friend since we were freshmen in high school. And, you know, from the beginning, I think I, you know, I'm an egotistical dude, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I know what I don't know. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, your limits. Say. I know my limits. I know what I can't do. I've been looking at guys like Saul Peter and saying, you be the musician. You be the guy that figures out how this goes. You, you do this, you do that, and I'll do what I do well. And what I do well is organizing people and, and then just being really aggressive uh, on stage, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my talents are relatively limited, and, you know, but I knew that. You know, so like when it came time to make Young Good Looking, for instance, I knew it needed killer background vocals in this pop punk age. And I knew a guy named Spike. <laughs> and this was before is this me Spike, first. Oh, this Gimme is from Spike from the Gimmies. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and this was before that group. And I, I was like, this guy's got an amazing voice. And, you know, it's him all over that stuff. One time only, Everybody's Girl, all over the place on that record. It's Spike coming up with these inspired background vocals on his own. And, uh, um, you know, again, it's a, it, I consider myself more like a casting director or a film director. I, I don't necessarily tell people exactly what to do. I get good people that I know can do shit. I have them do it. And then I give them minimal direction, you know, and, and, and then they know what to do, you know? So, so I mean, and, and yeah, I think it's something of a testament just to sort of me, I mean, I think part of it is that I'm a pretty loyal friend. I don't throw people away. You know, my friends from Burger Records are having a hard time right now. I didn't throw them away like a lot of people did. You know, loyalty is important to me and, and it, you know, also just humor and having fun with it. I think there were a lot of people that just enjoyed the fun of the band and other people that just enjoyed the outrageousness of the band and people that you know were drawn to it in kind of a charismatic way. But I, But I think over time it was also you know, man, a lot of this is just basic shit. You know, a lot of people in rock and roll are assholes. They don't pay their bills. 
They don't treat people right. You know, I, I, I you know, if I tell you I'm going to give you something, I give it to you 100% of the time. One of the very first guests that I had on this show three and a half years ago now was Nick. He was like the third or fourth guest on the show really early on. And he was telling me, like, we spent a whole night together after we'd done the chat, just like drunk a whole bottle of Jack, smoking, like just hanging out. And he said, you know, at various points in his life, you'd created roles for him and jobs for him where they might have not even been there and might have not even necessarily been needed just to look out for your friend. And he spoke so highly of you and of the as you say, the loyalty and the friendship that you've shown him. That means everything to me. You know, Nick, and Nick is exactly the same way. He's a great friend and a great person, you know. And it's like, yeah, I, I don't agree with his views on COVID-19, you know. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not exactly your best epidemiologist, right? <laughs> but, but, but I don't care because he's my buddy and we come from rock and roll. And, he, you know, he's had his problems. And, and that's the thing, like sometimes people dig me for that, you know, or, you know, people knock me for that and say, well, how, how, how do you hang out with this person or that person? I say, how, how do they hang out with me? I've done shit wrong too, man. I'm not perfect. I, I fucked up plenty of times and, and my friends stuck with me, you know? So it, it's, you know, I don't, that's one thing that kind of makes us old folks a little different than the, this, this group that's out now yeah. they like to turn on each other immediately as soon as as soon as someone says something that's not correct then you turn on them you know and it, I, I i don't i don't believe in that you know or, or, or this idea look you know i i uh even people i don't didn't know i mean when uh you know when fang came back and people didn't want to play shows with them and i i played a show with them i think it meant a lot to sammy and pete i took heat for it people said oh you know, this guy killed somebody and he hurt somebody. And I said, look, <laughs> this guy just spent eight years in San Quentin, man. That's, that's his penalty. I'm not the judge and the jury here. I'm not the guy who tells you everything you did wrong in your life and I'm going to make you pay for it. I, I You know, I, I have my opinions on things and, and, and there's people that I think are beyond beyond redemption. But it's like, you know, man, e even something as deep as killing somebody – it, it, if you pay for it with your life in a prison cell for a long time, okay, you know, I, I'm not the guy that's going to step on you when you get out. You know, and, and it, there's this tendency now to really eliminate people and throw people away. Yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they'll go back and they'll grab a statement that you made that was stupid or some art that you did that was insensitive, you know, from years ago and just act like, yeah, nobody ever changes. You're fucked. We're going to put you away now. And uh, yeah, it's very, it's very distressing to see, you know, so I'm, I'm glad I have loyal friends that care about me, not just for, you know, sort of on two different levels. You know, one is the level of just, I'm a cool guy, you know, and I've been cool to you. But the other is, musically like this band means something you know a, a lot of bands you know watered it down and said okay you know we used to be kind of crazy but now we're nice guys with this and that to me it was important that the dwarves always represent that spirit of anarchy in music like hey man shit might happen here you might get your head knocked in you know some somebody might get somebody might wind up having sex you know something might happen but you know it's like it's interesting to it's interesting to me, that. Black, like because you know you're clearly like Nick, somebody who's multifaceted and complicated and contradictory, and there's there's several versions of you, and I love the way that you put yourself out there and inhabit the role of the villain on stage because you want to, as you say, champion that anarchic, exciting, dangerous element that rock and roll and punk rock in particular used to represent and as you say now it's like don't say this don't do that but there's clearly a difference between what you're saying and doing on stage and in songs and then the real life you and who you are as a performer isn't who you are as a man in your life privately and i feel like a lot of people these days feel the need to reinforce publicly what an honorable person they are but it's often those people that spend all their time shouting about how good they are that are actually like the wrong ones with all the skeletons in their closet you know what i mean <laughs> a perfect example of that is that uh, Welsh band Lost Profits, right? That guy, you know, they were Mr. Inoffensive with all their little nothing songs about nothing and fucking everything was, you know, 
abstract and you know they certainly never said anything that you know it turns out the guy's one of the worst child molesters in history it's really like you know it, it, it's true it's like i feel like with a band like the doors we get it out of our system i get that shit out of my system if i want to scream fuck at the top of my lungs i do it you know if i want to scream about my frustrations my hatreds my anger i do it and then it's over and I don't need to go do that in my life, you know? I mean, I used to do more of it when I was younger, but, <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, the, the art actually serves as a medium, as a catharsis. And, and I think that's art at its best, whether you're talking about visual art, music, film, whatever it is you're talking about, you know, some people, you know, channel something and release it. And I can always feel that. And, and that's why I appreciate all different kinds of music. I mean, if you're sitting in a coffee house singing a political song, I can appreciate that if I feel your, if I, if, if, if I really feel it. But usually that kind of music, it's all from the head. It's not from the heart. Yeah. And you hear that in punk rock all the time. It's like you'll get a punk rock band and they're like, we're getting together because we're sick of sexism and racism. Here's my song. It's about sexism and how bad it is. Here's my song about racism. It's like, hey, I agree with you. Sexism is bad. Racism is bad. I, I, I agree with you. What I'm not getting is the art. I'm not getting you channeling anything. I'm not getting you accessing a part of yourself. All I'm getting is your top veneer bullshit layer where you make a, a, a statement and, and you know, it, it has no depth to it. You know what I mean? I mean, I think people respond to something like Bob Marley when he sings about justice because you can feel that he means it and because you can feel that it's, his music is integrated with his lyrics, is integrated with his feelings. Whereas, you know, a lot of these punk bands will come out with their statement and it just means nothing to me because I don't, I don't feel it. <laughs> I don't feel it. I don't know where it's coming from. It's just, okay. You sat down, you know you're supposed to be against racism, here's your song against racism, okay. You know, I mean, it's just not, it doesn't, it doesn't touch me, it doesn't move me, you know. No, same for me, and I think people sometimes have a hard time trying to differentiate between the art and the artist as well, so it's like, just because I'm saying this stuff in a song, and it might be dumb or offensive, that doesn't mean that that's who I am, because I'm playing a role in the same way that an actor in a film is playing a character. Like, have you had over the years a lot of people, I'm sure you have, but does it get frustrating if people just completely misconstrue you as an individual and be like, I know who you are, you're that guy on stage, that's what you represent, you're like a fucking horrible person <laughs> like does that bum you out or are you happy to kind of wear that crown and play that role because someone's got to or does it take its toll well yeah i mean i think you kind of hit it when you talk about the contra contradictory nature of it you know some days you wake up and it's like yeah man i'm wearing the black hat this is funny i love it fuck you you can't take it you know my, my band is not for the weaklings you go go for something else and then other days you wake up and it's like, shit, man, I wish somebody appreciated what I'm doing here. I think you might enjoy it, you know? And, and I, I think where it gets really tough is in terms of the industry, you know, cause, cause you'll have these experiences where it's like, you know, <laughs> you, you can't blame the world if, you know, the big radio station doesn't play your song or the big record label doesn't sign you. Oh, okay. But then later on, when you find out like that there was a process, and, and that it was like, oh, yeah, the people from the radio station actually really loved your record. But then they Googled you and they looked at your record cover. And then it was like, ah, we can't play this. Or, you know, the, more, more frequently with us, it would be like, oh, the people from that festival, they know you're great. There's actually a guy there that loves you guys. But then there were a couple people that thought, oh, some people might get upset about that. So we just won't call them back. You know, like a lot of the things that you don't get, you never even know about. You know, like yeah, right, course, right, because those offers like, never come with, through. Right, the offers never happen, and that—that's what people don't understand about censorship. Like censorship is not, you know, the the government shows up at your door at midnight and pounds it down and then takes you away, and that's censorship, right? I mean, that—that's the most basic level of it. But the real level of censorship, and you know, and of course that still happens a lot of places, and that's horrible. But, you know, the, the, the basic level, the currency of censorship 
in the arts is is you know business just ignores you they just go oh yeah you you don't exist actually it doesn't matter that you've got a hardcore fan it doesn't matter that you pack that club it doesn't matter that you're appreciated as always having integrity that means nothing the only thing that means anything is like you know, we're a corporation, we're afraid, we don't want to be associated with nudity or bad language, we, we, we heard you have a bad reputation, we're scared of you, and so you just don't exist, you know? No, we're not going to put you on our festival, no, we're not going to put you on our advertisement, you know, no, we're not going to blah, blah, and, and so most of the stuff that you don't, and, and, and that's, that's, I think, why, uh, uh, you know, a lot of artists censor themselves before it even gets out of their head. They'll have a thought that's similar to the kind of thought that I'll have, and then they'll immediately dismiss it. Like, well, I can't do that. Mm-hmm. My fans will get mad. My label will get mad. They won't play this. And, you know, my, my mommy will think that I'm a bad person. <laughs> and, and, and so immediately, you know, they've censored their own impulse. And that's why you get all this art that doesn't come from the heart and doesn't come from reality. It just comes from the head because it's like, oh, okay. I've figured out what people want to hear, you know, here's my little, uh, you know, attempt to make the music you want to hear, you know, are the drums like the drums you recognize from the radio, you know, is the beat like that? Okay, great. You know, the lyrics, okay, are these acceptable, like what you hear right now on the radio? Okay. You know, and that's, that's why things don't progress, because everybody's fighting last year's war and trying to be proper for last year, you know, and it's like, you, you, you know, you're not making art anymore. You're just afraid. And I think that one of the beauties of the door, you know, a lot of people have said to me in this Me Too era, how come you guys don't get caught up in all that shit? And it's like, because we admitted we were scum from the very beginning. <laughs> and we told you, okay, th- this is what we're thinking. And this is how we think, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's Teflon to us because we're not pretending to be your buddy. We're not pretending to be your pal. We're not pretending we don't fuck. We're not pretending we don't have hate. You know, so it's like, okay, <laughs> what yeah. are you going to do about it? There's you nothing know, to hide. It's all on the, you know, it's all on yeah. the table. It's right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me ask you, you know, this, so. Black, like, because, because of the things that you sing about and because of the imagery and the iconography and, you know, the reputation, the mythology that surrounded the band, do you feel like that's held you back from, you know, being a bigger band? And when you look back, are you happy with the decisions that you made or would you have done it any differently? Would you have liked to have been a more successful, perhaps mainstream darling than you are? Or are you happy again to kind of represent true, authentic, exciting art? And, you know, perhaps you took a hit and didn't get as big as some of those other bands, but you've remained excited and the integrity is in place. Well, again, it's another great question, Matt. I mean, and, and I think you've hit the nail on it a few times. There's a duality there. You know, I'm very proud to be that hardcore motherfucker that didn't give an inch. Yes. And I'm proud just as a working American, you know, I, 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 you know, I worked in factories, man. I worked as a delivery guy. I worked in a restaurant. I worked in retail, you know, uh, um, you know, I'm not a dumb guy and I come from a very educated family and that was a hard move that I made so that I could be in a rock band. It ain't easy when you can't afford a bed. It ain't easy when you stand in line at the, at the, uh, um, you know, food stamp line. It, it ain't easy when you stand in line at the uh, uh, free clinic, you know. And, and fortunately, those days are, are behind me. But, you know, I, I sacrificed everything to do this, and I did it, and I stuck to it. And so, yeah, I'm just super, super proud of that. At the same time, I look back on a lot of just strategic mistakes, things that I could have done differently that either would have made the band bigger, or I think, you know, more in my case, it would have been, I was kind of on track to be a comedy writer and to be sort of moving in that world. But I was like, yeah, fuck all this rock and roll, (laughs) you know? (laughs) And I think, I think had I done that stuff, and sort of stayed in New York and stayed in school, which I just couldn't do. I, I just couldn't tolerate anybody telling me what to do, you know. And and I think had I had a little bit more patience and stuck it out and done that, I probably could have done the band in just as nasty a way. But 
actually had a lot more influence, made some money, did some other things in, in the other parts of my life instead of working in a factory, instead of, you know, doing these kinds of things. But there's no substitute for working in a fucking factory if you want to know what people go through. Yeah. You know, and this is what people don't understand. You know, there's all these working class hero bullshit guys, you know, I mean, maybe they grew up in a hard way. Yeah. But then they had the record deal by the time they're 18, 19, 20, yeah, and yeah, they yeah. never think about it again. So it's like, okay, Mr. Working Class, you know, you had a tough time growing up. Look, I, I know what it means to be sitting in that fucking factory when you know you can do more, when you know you're capable of other shit, but you don't have any money and your mommy ain't helping you and nobody's doing shit for you and you got to pay your bills and live your life. You, there's no substitute for understanding that. You can't come from a trust fund and understand that. You know, you couldn't, you couldn't know the reality that the dwarves have known if you didn't, you know, have to live that. If you didn't have to deal with, you know, the fucking food stamp line and, the, and, and that kind of stuff. And look, I, I come from a nice suburban home. I never claimed to be anything else. My, my first band was called Suburban Nightmare. You know, but that's kind of the point. We had something to lose. You know, I would meet guys all the time, and it was like, yeah, you know, I, I had to move out of the house. My mom's third boyfriend was beating on me, and we were shooting dope, and I didn't know what to eat. I was like, yeah, okay, of course you're in a rock band. What the fuck else are you going to do, you know? It, I mean, in my case, it's like I gave up a lot of shit, dude. <laughs> you know, you hear me. I could have been a lawyer. I could have been this, that, the other thing. It was right there, you know? Well, it's that but duality I, I, again of being educated, but being, yeah. you know... I guess a lot of people who don't know you and don't take the time to know you would be like, oh, he's a dumbass because he sings about motherfucker and slut and getting high and all that. But, you know, exactly. I th all my favorite comedians come from a place of, you know, enlightenment and they're educated. It's just they choose to be outrageous because it's fun. And it's, you know, people are so easily wound up. I want to ask you this. I know your friends or were friends once upon a time you collaborated and worked with Dexter Holland. And for me, the dwarves could have been as big as the offspring. The songs were as good. The music was as good. Obviously, you know, they were that bit more palatable and parent friendly. Um, do you ever talk to guys like that and sort of see what they've done and think like, wow, if only I'd have toned it down a bit, we could have gone there? Or, or was it always <laughs> the case of planting your flag and going, no, I'm going to sing about getting high and sluts and fucking going to the drugstore <laughs> and all of that, and that's fucking how I roll? Well, Dexter is one of those guys who's been so great to me. I mean, I just saw him over Christmas, and he sang on some of my solo stuff. Oh, wow. And cool. the fact that that guy comes out, I mean, this is a guy who's – First of all, he's just a genius level guy. I mean, he's he's got a master's in in molecular biology. You know, he he fucking pilots his own plane. I mean, the guy is just very smart and and very accomplished. And at the same time, he's just been so kind to me. And 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 it's sort of even cooler because we didn't grow up together. You know, I don't come from Orange County. I didn't come from their scene. I I come from Illinois. And and like you know, so he, by the time Dexter met me, it was already kind of set who I was and what I was doing. So I think he, yeah, he liked me for that. But, um, you know, the kindness that he's shown to me and continued to show to me, it's amazing, you know, and, and, and it's like, uh, I, I do, you know, the other thing is I don't want to sit here and sort of act like, oh yeah, the dwarves could have been huge if only we didn't have so much integrity. I mean, the fact is <laughs> We knew that we, we knew that we were tweaking people. Yeah. We knew that we were playing with people's expectations of things. We knew that there was a the downside to that. I mean, the hard part for me wasn't so much like when you saw, you know, like a band like the Offspring is more like a white hat band, and the Dwarves are more like a black hat band. And and I appreciate both kinds the same way I love the Beatles and I love the Stones. Yeah, yeah. You know, they 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 they, they, they mean different things to me, but I love them both. And, and, you know, the same way, you know, I can appreciate, you know, different kinds of, of groups. You know, Slayer is a black hat band. Metallica is a white hat band. You know, it, that it like, and, and, and at the end of the day. It's all about which band is going to piss off your parents, isn't it? <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, Dexter's songwriting was so high quality. I mean, for my money, he was the best songwriter of the, of the era. But, yeah, I don't think we ever could have been what we were in that if we kept our form 
we never really could have have been that. But the thing that would be frustrating to me would be, you know, I remember it must have been like 94, 95. You know, we, we lost the deal with Sub Pop. There was a big scandal over it. There was the whole death of Hugh cannot be named. And well, can we backtrack a bit? Can, can we get into that? Like, uh, what <laughs> with, did they just lose their fucking minds when you pulled that stunt? And is that why you got dropped? <laughs> <laughs> again, there's so much misinformation. We actually didn't get dropped. We right, okay. didn't get signed again. You right. know, our, our, our contract had expired, but they put out a notice saying that we had been dropped. To try and, and cover their own to, ass. Yeah, I mean, they kind of acted in the, in the wake of it like it was, you know, uh, uh, they were part of the scandal and part of the thing, and it was all part of the fun. But really, it was just like, they couldn't take the heat they were getting from, you know, the, the media and and other labels and people really saying, oh, they've gone, doors have gone too far this time. <laughs> and so they just kind of came. So on insensitive, it, you know? but, yeah. Right. But, but um, it, you know, in, in the wake of that happening, I remember I, I was I was friendly. They, they had a great publicist at Sub Pop who was a nice woman. I won't go into it. She's uh, very highly placed now in, in – uh, um, promotion. She's one of the biggest promotion people there are, and and um, y- you know, at the time, you know, she, she she liked me. We were friends, you know, and uh, she took me to see this new group. Uh, and this was a couple years after I'd lost my sub pop deal. Doors were at a very low point. She came into town and and was like, "Hey, I want to take you to see this group." And we went to see this this brand new group, Marilyn Manson. You know, right. And, and, you know, I'm looking at this stage set and it looks like something out of the Nuremberg <laughs> rallies, you know, and, and I mean, everything is like, you know, this very aggressive sexuality, but also, you know, homosexuality and transsexuality and, and, you know, this, this sort of fascist imagery and, and music that's just beating at, at your head. And at one point, you know, she's smiling and she looks at me and she says, yeah, you know, the great thing about this band, you know, it's like you know, the band you love to hate, you know what I mean? And then there's this kind of moment where I kind of turn around and look at her and she looks at me and she kind of realizes like, oh, that's what you were doing. <laughs> the <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? And it's yeah. Like, yeah, and, and this is like, you know, when I see a band like Green Day or Offspring that gets much bigger than the Dwarves, it kind of makes me think, well, yeah, you know, they made some different choices and they tried to be a little bit nicer around the edges and it worked out well for them. It, was, it hurt more when it was like a band that was pushing Satan and death and sex like 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 Marilyn Manson. And somehow they had been chosen to to, you know, be huge. And it was like, wait a minute, like we chose Satan and death and sex. You know, yeah, why yeah, can't yeah. we be huge? You know what I mean? I mean, that, those were a little harder. You know, when you get a band like a Slayer or a fucking certain bands where it was like, Jesus, you know, these guys are, are being pretty nasty too, you know, and that, that a lot of that kind of comes down to just luck, luck of the draw, but it also comes down to just management. Oh, well, Black, the best lot- example is Eminem. I mean, like, if you listen to that first Eminem record, it's not a million miles away oh, yeah. from the dwarves, is it? In terms of like, oh, yeah. shocking, funny, cheeky, <laughs> playful, dark, like, it's all the same stuff, it's just packaged differently. Yeah, I'm buzzing, dirty dozen, naughty, rotten rhymer, person that treats players worse than Marty Schottenheimer. Yeah, I mean, that fucking record, every moment of that record is genius as far as I'm concerned. And, and yeah, that's a perfect example. Again, if you look at Eminem and he was, if he was just a white kid making a tape, he was nothing. Then, you know, when you had Dr. Dre and the power of Jimmy Iovine behind him, all of a sudden he was a genius, you know? Yeah. And, and it was, it was the same with Marilyn Manson. I mean, when Marilyn Manson was, you know, some guys with a weird vibe in a Florida nightclub, it was like, nobody cares about this. And when it was like, Oh, Trent Reznor loves them. It was like, boom, you know, it was the biggest thing. I, I was a huge Misfits fan. Saw the Misfits 1982, you know, uh, uh, you know, so I was, I was in that from the, from the ground floor Nobody gave a fuck about the Misfits, dude. Everybody's supposed to be a fan now. Nobody liked them and nobody cared. Then the guy from Metallica started wearing a Misfits shirt. Yeah, and, and covering every, Last Caress and all of a sudden, boom. Everything followed on that, the whole Danzig career and everything that came up. And so, you know, I, I try and be philosophical about it. 
you know, had one of those moments happen for the Gores, then the same thing might very well have happened for us. And we could have kept the same kind of rep and just celebrated it and wrote it up, up to something. Because when you combine that with the kind of Eric Valentine production, I think we could have had radio hits and even with our image. But, you know, man, it's like life ain't like that. You know, that the, the <laughs> Uh, you know, what is from the Bible, you know, many are called, but few are chosen. You know, everybody wants to be a huge rock star. Everybody wants to make a million bucks. Everybody wants to do this and that. You know, you, you got to love art. You got to do it for the sake of doing art. You know, I, I did it for when I made some money and got some pussy and had some fun. And I also did it for when I got dropped and when I was hated and when I got threatened and when I got stabbed. You know, it was like, okay, my motto is, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. You know, that's how I do it. But Amen. Not, a lot of people ain't, ain't like that, you know. When you're on Sub Pop, are you living in Seattle around that time or are you just on that label? But are you around those bands because you seem so out of step with that slow, dirgy, low end kind of, you know, what we now associate with the Sub Pop grunge aesthetic? Like, were you, were any of those bands around at that time fans of the Dwarves? Would they turn up at your shows? Would they come and see you? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, that was an interesting era because all of the grunge bands were basically guys from hardcore bands and yeah. hardcore was dead, right? So, so it was like, okay, hardcore's dead, let's do this. You know, it was guys who were like, let's just admit we really like rock and roll. You know, let's just admit that we really like Black Sabbath or ACDC, you know, but they'd come up in the punk scene. So the dwarves, when we went up there, uh, you know, we were invited by Danny Bland, uh, who, who used to book, uh, you know, he was kind of sub pops booking guy. Um, and, and, uh, you know, he, he brought us up there cause he heard tooling for a warm tea bag, thought it was a really funny, outrageous record. And that was a very early EP of ours before Blood Guts. And, and you know, uh, we went up there and started playing. And somehow we became like the token punk band of the grunge scene. And so we didn't really get a lot of fans <laughs> because the fans liked grunge. Yeah. But all the people from the bands were like, holy shit, this is like we remember from a couple of years ago. Right, because this is 88, 89 right, or 80, 80, 89, I guess, and so, and so, you know, people from bands like Mud Honey or, or Nirvana was like, fuck, this is great, this was like from five, six years ago when there was hardcore, but there's no hardcore anymore, these guys are great. So, it, so we kind of became a band's band instead of a fan's band, <laughs> and, we, and so, you know, there was this, you know, it was like, hey, you know, Kurt Cobain thinks we're cool, and, and Mark Arm thinks we're cool, but, you know, only 50 people showed up for our show. <laughs> you know, there was a lot of that shit, you know, and, and we were so out of step with what was popular. <laughs> there were 12 bands signed to Sub Pop, I think, in 1993, and 11 of them got major label deals, including, you know, guy, guys like the Super Suckers, even, you know, that were that were yeah, big yeah. Dwarves fans and even based a lot of their early sound on the Dwarves. The only band that did not get a major label from Sub Pop was us. That was it. We were the only one. So, you know, it was very, uh, you know, yeah, there were some hard times there, man. It's hard sitting there, especially when you're a young man. You watch other people getting money and success and shit, and you're going, fuck, I, I got to go work a day job now. I got to go, I got to go, you know. I, I remember a roommate coming home with a, you know, uh, 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 government cheese and shit, you know. I mean, it was like, oh, shit, you know, this is how I got I got to live, I, you know, I, I'm I'm so close. You'd feel, you know, so uh, th yeah, there were some fucking hard times in there, and it, and it was hard. It was hard watching people that were cleaner than us get big, and it was hard watching people that were just as dirty as us get big, and it was really hard watching, you know, the sort of clean, dirty guys, right? The, you know, the I mean, for my money, Kurt Cobain was a great songwriter, and and you know, deserved a, a, you know a lot of success. But, you know, he was a junkie and did all kinds of stupid shit. And, and it was like, fuck, man, I, I'm not a junkie. <laughs> you know, like, you, you chose this guy to be the hero and I'm the villain. And, uh, you know, how, how does that work, you know? That's and interesting. While, you, yeah. You know, I mean, after a while, you kind of realize, 
you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of randomness to this business and there's a lot of randomness to life. I mean, I think that's one big difference again, between the generations, you know, uh, um, <laughs> the current generation kind of blames a, a lot of bad, you know, bad luck. Like there should be somebody there to fix it for you. And it's like, there's nobody to fix it for you. You know, life is unfair. It's fundamentally unfair. You know, that, that's why we have politics. That's why we have these means of changing things because life is unfair, you know, and, and, you know, there's some shit you can never solve. And it isn't just about people's race and people's gender, although those things are very important. And there's a lot of injustice around that stuff. But look, there's also injustice around who's cute and who's ugly. I mean, Kurt Cobain is a little cuter than me. You think it's a coincidence <laughs> that, you know, I mean, half the girls I fucked in the 1980s had a poster of, of uh, Chris Cornell that they were looking at while while we were fucking, you know. I mean, the, <laughs> You know, it's like life is not fair. Some people are taller. Some people are smarter. You know. What do you think it was about that scene? I'm reading Mark Lanigan's book at the moment, and it's so dark and so depraved, and the, you realize really the extent of the, the the depravity and the bleakness that was around that scene. Was it just the heroin? Like, what made all those guys so dark and you know obviously nearly all of them now are gone to either overdose or suicide and you read about that time and all these bands that were you know in, re incredibly successful and changing the world but none of them seemed happy and do you think it was just that absolute you know the devastation the heroin causes yeah i mean it never or was it more than me. that as always it was more than that i mean her heroin has a lot to do with it you know that the, the um, it, there's a particular hopeless resignedness that comes with it. I mean, I've done dope and it really makes you feel like, Hey, life's okay. You know, I could sit in this cardboard box and I'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really does that to your brain, you know? So it's kind of like, I think that, it, it, you know, the drugs themselves warped some of those guys and, and, and made them do very bizarre actions and, 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 uh, and made several of them take their own lives. I mean, even Cornell much later, you know, it was a variation of dope, whatever medications he was taking. And, 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 you know, it was, uh, um, and then sometimes it was just people ODing. They weren't trying to die, but they just, eh, you know, but yeah, my, uh, you know, like, like I was saying, my, my friend Jim from material issue, he was another dope guy and he, he wasn't part of the grunge thing. He was trying to be a pop guy and do happy stuff. And still, you know, that dope will get you. And it's so sad because people are predisposed to different drugs. I mean, I did dope and, and I just knew it didn't agree with me. I just puked a lot and it was weird. And I've always been like that with alcohol too, you know? And so I think it, that wasn't my drug of choice. Right. And so it, it didn't, you know, I think for a lot of those Seattle guys, yes, it, the dope, the day, you know, you can't pump that shit into yourself day in, day out doing downers without it bringing you down, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's that side of it. I think the other side of it is that Seattle itself is kind of bleak, you know, weather-wise. It, it is, you know, it's like London, you know? It's like there's a lot of there's a lot of rain and a lot of just kind of you look outside and it's like, eh, you know, and that, I think that affects people. But I think also, you know, it was a hopeless time. They, they didn't call us Generation X for no reason. You know, we, we were a generation adrift, and we had really been robbed by the generation before. You know, the, the, the hippie generation, the baby boomers, they call them, they, they were a very destructive force who thought that they were great. They, you know, they thought that the whole world was in black and white till they came along and handed a cop a flower and made everything right again. And then, and to that hippie generation, they were just the be all and end all of everything. You know, they, they, they didn't appreciate that their parents gave them a world in which a house in San Francisco cost 25 grand and a car cost $500. And by the time the hippies handed that world to us, the generation that was me and Kurt Cobain and Chris Cornell and that, that same house in San Francisco now costs 300 grand and that car now costs $5,000. And, and, you know, it was like they gave us a world that we couldn't afford and that we couldn't live in and that didn't have a place for us. 
And and the whole time they did it, they were telling us, oh, you know, how come you're not as cool as we are? And how come you don't have the Beatles? And how come you're not, you know, they, they didn't, they were a very selfish generation overall. I mean, obviously you can't generalize about people. There were lots of wonderful, selfless, great people part of that generation. There's millions of people in that generation. But overall, what they did was they looted the fucking economy. And they went from giving us flower power in 1968 to giving us Ronald Reagan in 1980. You know, they, 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 they made a bleak world for us, and we didn't see a lot of future. And in that way, we're a lot like this generation that's coming up now that they're calling Generation Z. You know, they, they don't see a future. We robbed them. We took, we took the economy from them. We said, no, you're going to have to live with your parents forever. We said, no, just, just look at your phone. You can look at other people having fun because you ain't going to have any, you know? And I mean, I think, you know, th- there was a bleakness to my generation. And unfortunately, the dope and the alcohol, you know, fed, fed into that. What was your thing? When you were like, you know, experimenting, what, what kind of connected and resonated? Marijuana, marijuana. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I started smoking pot when I was 12. I stole it from my brother. Um, so, you know, for me, it was always marijuana was the best thing. And then I liked things like acid and, you know, hallucinogen stuff that gave you a trip and was interesting. Um, but of course that drags you down too. And the marijuana they have now is so potent. It's yeah. 10 times as potent as what I grew up smoking. So, you know, you got a lot of people now sitting around, take two hits off a joint. They're paralyzed all day. You know, I mean, it's like they, 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 it's the marijuana in a way is kind of the dope of now, I guess. But it's just it's not quite as destructive, you know, but but it's it's, uh, you know, it, it's funny because I promoted drug use so much in my music, you know. But again, to me, it was just hedonism. It was just I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be high if I feel like it, you know, and, and it was like, you know, it was no accident. My song wasn't called cocaine. It was called free cocaine. (laughs) You know, I was like, I'm broke. If you're giving this, I'll do it. You know, I mean, it was kind of, you know, I was more of an up kind of person and, you know, speed was too much for me. So I didn't, I didn't get strung out in that way. There were a lot of people in California doing methamphetamine. And I think that, really has an effect on your brain similar to dope just extreme paranoia and and it really just eats your brain out from the inside and and you know it's hard to come back from that you know so again a lot of this is just luck of the draw you know i had a buddy we used to do acid in high school all the time uh you know he asked me to send him some acid at one point when we were in our twenties and oops, you know, next thing I know, he's a diagnosed schizophrenic in Bellevue hospital. You know, there, there, there's no guarantees with this shit. If you fuck around with drugs, man, you could go down hard the first time you do it. Or you could be like me, you know, I can still smoke a joint. I'm in my fifties and it's all good. I'm not tripping. So, you know, it, it, <laughs> there's no guarantees. You, you fuck around in that world at your peril. How do you and Nick first meet each other and what's the nature of that friendship over the years? Because he spoke very openly about, you know, his early introduction to speed when he was very young. Like he said, an uncle gave him his first try of that when he was like 11 or something. Like, how do you two meet and what's, yeah. the, what's the bond there? What's the connection? Because although I can see that you're very close from what I've heard and what I see on stage, you're also incredibly different characters. Yes, we're incredibly different characters. And I love Nick unreservedly he he represents rock and roll to me he he does a lot of the shit that i sing about <laughs> you know he yeah. he he is he is the real deal but on top of that you know there were always a lot of guys that were sitting around you know doing dope and acting like it was going to make them keith richards and it's like no man <laughs> keith richards is talented you're not you know the, the it, 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 uh, you know, Nick Oliveri, we call him Rex Everything in our, in our group, yeah. is, you know, uh, um, a great talent, period. You know, when, when uh, you know, when I met him and I saw his band, Caius, I was impressed with them. But immediately I picked him out as the, the, the one that meant something to me, you know. And, uh, you know, John is a great singer, you know. I love, the, you know, I love the whole group but but you know 
Nick, to me, just had that special something. And then when I heard him sing, which he didn't do in that group, I was like, holy shit, this is a whole other thing. And again, you talk about channeling things. I mean, he channels this aggression in a way that no one in the world can. You know, he, but he's a very intuitive, smart musician. He knows what he's doing on a bass to a point that's supernatural. And, you know, so I, I was drawn to him both as an artist and as just a fucking wild man. You know, both of those things attracted me and made me say, well, this guy's great. But, you know, he's a loyal friend. He's a good guy. You know, I, I'll give you an example. We, the way that we met Caius was we, we were recording the, the uh, Thank Heaven for Little Girls record in Madison, Wisconsin. And they happened to be playing a gig at a little place called OK's Corral. And, you know, we went in and there were 10 people there and we were laughing, you know, who were these jock looking dudes from SoCal. And, you know, we just thought it was funny. And then we wound up hanging out with them and partying and we had a great time. We were all in a hotel room and everybody went crazy. And it was just like rock and roll fun. And they became our friends. And honestly, we didn't really care for their music. I, I didn't care. Um, you know, it took it took me really being familiar with them to start to see what was cool about their music. But at first glance, I didn't care about it. And, and, you know, it was more just these guys are my friends, you know. So they hadn't done a national tour. And their management asked, uh, you know, asked, you know, that was you know, one of my first experiences seeing like a bunch of teenagers that had managers riding around with them in a van. And, you know, <laughs> th th there was this other element to them that was like really rich guys, you know, that were that were like trust fund rich guys that had managers and lawyers and all that shit. But I, I didn't even understand that part of it. And of course, Nick was not a trust fund guy. He was, of course, he was yeah. The but, but, you know, it was like, okay. You know, so so uh, um, we took them on their first tour, and uh, um, you know, so I think we sort of have a special place in their mythology, and 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 you know, it was it was more about being friends with them and kind of forcing it down people's throats. I remember taking them to Seattle and people going, "What are you hanging out with these jock guys for? Doing like Sabbath shit?" You know, that was, you know what I mean? And I was like, "Oh no, these guys are our friends," you know, and but. As soon as Dave Grohl on MTV wore a Caius shirt and said, I like Caius, again, it was just like with dancing. Immediately, Caius's currency went through the roof. And people were like, oh, this is an important band that people are thinking about. You know, so it was like, whoa, weird. You know, I wasn't expecting it. And, and uh, you know, but so that was sort of how we came to be friends. But I, I'll give an example of what kind of a friend Nick Oliveri is. You know, we, we were on the road during that tour and i think we even had to cancel a bunch of shows because we were so broke and a lot of the shows got canceled and nobody could afford anything and you know we we were set to play the final show back in the desert there where they were doing a generator party there were no clubs there so those guys had to like somebody rented a generator and he had a party in the middle of nowhere that was where the desert scene kind of came from and it was an admirable thing you know it was people putting something together and and uh you know, so that was where the tour was supposed to end. The Dwarves had a rented van that we weren't supposed to take out of California. And the entire transmission fell out of it in in Nevada somewhere or, or Arizona, I guess. Or, yeah, it was in Ar Ar Arizona or maybe even New Mexico. <laughs> and so we were like, fuck, what are we going to do if we tell the van company they're going to make us pay for a new van for them because we left the state? I called Nick and I said, Nick, I don't know what to do. And he said, just sit tight. He showed up. He drove all night. Ten hours later, he shows up to where we are. And he's got his van with a tow bar. And, uh, 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 and you know, fortunately, the van we'd rented had a tow hitch on it. And he towed us all the way back to California where we then dropped the van, called the van company and said, hey, the transmission fell out of this, and, and they paid for it. So, I mean, this is a guy who, who will drive in the middle of the night to come see some people that he doesn't know that well. And then, you know, none of us, we, <laughs> you know, Nick's a handy guy. He can fix your roof for you. He can put in your insulation. He fucking did that with that van. We, we, didn't, we couldn't even afford a mechanic, let alone do anything. You know, so this, I mean, that kind of loyalty is is difficult to find, man. And I'll, I'll never forget it. You know, Nick, 
Nick is a great person, you know, and pe- uh, uh, people can talk shit about him all they want. Don't do it in front of me. Was part of the, you know, I guess the inspiration or the reason behind the massacre track and that diss on Josh, was that part of you sticking up for him because of what had gone down between those two? Uh, <laughs> not exactly. It no. wound up that way. <laughs> <laughs> what went down with that, if you don't mind getting into it? Well, I mean, Josh, you know, I, I don't like to give him any more press. He, he pays publicists to get him press, he, <laughs> whatever, you know. So it's like I, I'd much rather talk about me than him. But, you know, lo- long story short, Nick had a solo album, and I produced it and paid for a lot of it. And then Josh just tried to take the whole thing over at the end when it was almost over. Uh, and, and it wasn't a very cool thing to do. And he of course did it with his lawyers and his management and his pushy shit. And I didn't want Nick's record to get caught up in the middle of it. So I just sort of acquiesced and, <clears throat> and let it go. But <laughs> the diff that I say on that record is, you know, you slept on my floor. Queen. Now I'm sleeping through your records. Yeah, exactly. So and, and basically <laughs> It is one of the great disses of all time. And that's a reference um, to you taking them out on their first tour and giving them that well, leg up. Here, here's the thing. It's a reference to two different things. When I said Queens of the Trust Fund, yeah. <laughs> that's a direct reference to Josh. Yeah, he, he is the Queen of the Trust Fund, <laughs> and he can live with that. Um, the, the reference to you slept on my floor and I'm sleeping through your records was an insult on Nick because he slept on my floor for many years. It, you know, and, and so I was dissing the two of them. Right. And saying, fuck you guys for, for, for treating me this way. Between the time that I recorded that and the time that this record got mixed, Nick got thrown out of the Queen. <laughs> so he came over to the studio. I played him the track and he laughed his ass off. And I just recorded him laughing over it. <laughs> so by the time the record came out, it, you know, I think Josh was doubly incensed because not only was I insulting him, and of course, you know, the insults that hurt are the ones that are true, right? The, it, it, you know, so he he was he was hurt by that, but he was also hurt by the fact that Nick, who was supposed to be his guy, was laughing at him and, and making fun of it during it. You know what I mean? But to me, I was insulting the both of them when I did it. But by the time it came out. Nick joined me in just insulting him, you know, and that was sort of how it, how it wound up, you know, and, and, uh, I, I think it's hilarious and one of the most interesting tracks. I mean, again, consider how much different the dwarves are than every other band. I mean, it's a hip hop song, but with live drums. Yeah. It's a hip hop song delivered to you from a guy who makes no attempt to look black, act black or dress black. And, you know, it, it, it has San Quinn, one of the great San Francisco gangster rappers, <laughs> guesting on it, as well as, you know, I mean, that record has, has San Quinn on it. And then, you know, so there actually was some hip hop legitimacy to that must die record, you know. And then, <laughs> you know, the, um, the, the uh, you know, the whole insult. Is an, you know, I start out because I, it's my voice that opens the most famous Queens thing. I, hey, it's Kip Casper, right? That's all me. I made it up. I didn't get a writing credit for it. You know, I didn't get appreciated for it. I think they put my name on the record somewhere. But it, yeah, so I, I came up with that. And um, I, so I used that voice to diff those guys on the, on the record. So there's so many meta levels to that record. It works in so many different ways, you know, and, and you know, and just, I'm, I'm very proud of it. Again, I love hip hop music, but I never wanted to be like Limp Biscuit and put on a sideways baseball cap and go, yo, you know what I mean? It's like, I, I love hip hop in a real way and I understand it in a deeper way. I think than a lot of people do. And I made, you know, I made what I think is a pretty classic track. And yet yeah, it includes that insult at the end, but it, it insults a lot of people that had done weird shit to me. Good Charlotte, you know, I'd helped to write their record and they left me out of it. And, and, you know, like various bands get this creed, you know, I never met that guy, but that was a classic, like virtue signaling, you know, Jesus 
you know, pushing Jesus and putting in all this shit. So a lot of bands get insulted on that. A lot of things get turned around on that. I mean, it's a very interesting track. And Dexter's on it as well, right? Dexter Holland is on it as well. Yeah, How he, cool of he, him you know, to be on it, even though you're going after all these people, like to still be like, yeah, I'm going to jump on that with you. That's amazing. That's a testament to his sense of humor and character as well. That is. Oh, yeah. And and when his manager called me about it, because, of course, you know, I had to clear it with all them. He was like, yeah, I'm one of these pussy ass managers you make fun of. in the song. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like, yeah, sorry. You know? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's such a meta track, and th- and that's what's so amazing about it. It's like, you know, but marketing is everything, so almost no one has heard that track, but then you pull out, you know, the poor excuse for boring music that, <laughs> that certain other groups have been making for a long time, and, you know, people know all about it, you know? I mean, that's, the, that's marketing for you, you know? If more people knew Massacre... <laughs> You know that it would be a better world, you know, <laughs> but did, they don't. Did you know, people not just, get switched onto it happened. after what happened with you and Josh? Did people not discover the track through that whole shit? No, shit. because because of course it was all his marketing and his shit, and I'm the big hero and I'm the tough guy and you know whatever whatever story he told. You know he was he was rescuing. You know I was I was you know murdering a bunch of three year olds and he came in and rescued them or whatever. People didn't even know about the song. You know, Rolling Stone wrote it up and just it was something fun to say about somebody famous. They didn't, you know, I I was just an afterthought. They didn't even ask for a comment from me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, there is no journalism here. This is all fucking marketing. It was all just a way, you know, to, to him, it probably just increased his marketing. And it was like, oh, what a tough guy. You know, the reality of it was he came up behind me poured some booze over my head into my eyes so I was blinded when I turned around he hit me with a bottle and then ran away I mean there was nothing like you know in his in his fantasy it was a big fight like Muhammad Ali had in the fucking ring you know or some shit it wasn't that at all it was a complete cheap shot from a you know from a chicken shit asshole you know (laughs) but you know but if you have publicists they can make the story whatever they want it to be. My side of the story never came out and my nothing came out. And, and, you know, and, and all of that would have been fine if people would have gone and listened to massacre, even if when they were reporting it in billboard or rolling stone or whatever, they would have said, you know, he was upset over this song. Maybe some people would have heard it, but you know, it's, it's all marketing, dude. Most of what you know about rock and roll is not true. And it didn't happen that way. You know, what? It's uh, there's all kinds of stories. I mean, if you j- just look at the English interpretation of rock and roll, if you read any English book on rock and roll, it goes something like this: Elvis came along and stole rock and roll music from black people. Then nothing happened. Then ten years later, the Beatles made rock and roll good. <laughs> you know, sort of that's sort of their interpretation of the story. You know, it kind of leaves out everything after rockabilly. And it was all supposed to be nothing until the Beatles came along. You know what I mean? Meanwhile, you actually go and look at what happened. And it's like, fuck. Elvis was brilliant. He combined R&B with country, with pop, made something new. Bunch of people jumped on the bandwagon. There's tons of great rockabilly records. And then tons of great soul records and Motown records and tons of great teeny bopper records and all kinds of shit before anybody in England even finally figured out, oh, we could cover one of these songs. Well, what, you know what, I mean? I mean, what I've always so loved about the Dwarves is you always have had this for me, like all my touchstones are in your band, whether it's girl group or surf rock or garage rock and roll, you know, or, you know, just Ramones, yeah. but I guess Ramones was all of that anyway, and Misfits, like it's all there. And for me, some of the stuff, and then, you know, you do for crazy hardcore songs and then you've got like almost speed metal and like the amount of different areas of the musical spectrum which you guys have always explored but still under the the moniker and the styling of the dwarves has always fascinated me so much about your band but the style that i love particularly the most is when you're doing stuff like salt lake city it's fun to try those kind of girl group like do yeah. almost wow. bubblegum pop stuff i love that so much you hit the nail on the head you know we're very influenced by all that stuff 
and it's there in the music and you can hear it. And, you know, and incidentally, I love the Beatles. I got all their records. I love them to death. They're an amazing group. I'm influenced by that, too. And a lot of great English groups. I think Motorhead was a big influence on me. I think, uh, you know, the Damned were a big influence on me. I think, uh, you know, there, there were so, the Sex Pistols. I mean, that record, you know, they only have one record, but, you know, it's an amazing record. And, you know, there, there's, there's uh, uh, you know, I think really America and England are pretty much where all the rock and roll happened. Yeah. In modern times, some cool shit came out of Sweden, Norway, and, you know, some Japanese shit was cool and here and there. But basically, I mean, you know, it's sort of 90% America, you know, 9% England, and then everybody else kind of thing. But, you know, it was like, uh, you know, I'm glad you hear all those influences. The, the two influences I think people don't get a lot is the hip hop influence in terms of the slang and yeah, the yeah, approach. Yeah. You know, and, and one thing I glommed on with hip hop early was that they were willing to say their own name and aggrandize themselves. So, you know, the, the dwarves do that all over the place. We reference ourselves, you know, our own mythology. And I kind of got that from Frank Zappa, who was sort of the original kitchen sink guy who would talk about himself, reference his own songs and do every different genre. It's just, he, you know, but a lot of people, again, don't really associate the dwarves with Zappa, but he was like my biggest formative influence. It's just, I realized early that I wasn't talented in that way. I wasn't a composer. I wasn't going to be able to do that, but I could do other things. And the sort of organizing talented people part of Zappa really rubbed off on me. And that kind of influence- absurdist humor as well. Yeah, Absolutely. I think the other influence that people don't really get with me is that, um, it, you know, I'm influenced by just the great American songbook. I have most of what I listen to is from the 1920s and 30s. And, and, and I, you know, part of that is just to settle my head, man, because I really don't want to hear rock records <laughs> because I've, I've yeah. had my head pounded with that for so long. you got to clean the and, palate, and, haven't you? <laughs> Yeah, and and also it's what I grew up with. You know, my dad collected sheet music. He, so he has, you know, 20,000 different sheets. He just knows all the old songs. And uh, um, the songwriters I admire were the ones that took phrases and and made them into something. So something like, you know, anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Or, or you know, birds do it. Please do it. Even educated, please do it. Let's do it. Let's fall in love. You know, it's like when you when you take a phrase like let like let's do it or anything you can do, I can do better or or whatever. That is where the great songwriting comes from to me. And so and so I made up my own phrase. I wish that I was dead. It's something every little kid says, you know, um, is there anybody out there? You know, it's something that you, that you would ask, you know, do, 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 let me show you how it's done. It's like a statement that you would make. I think a lot of bands don't really grasp that songs are all around you and phrases are all around you and you plug them in, you know, and, and that I really got that from the great songwriters. I, I consider myself as pretentious as it sounds in in a line with, Cole Porter and Irving Berlin and these, these kinds of people, um, which I know sounds ridiculous to anyone no, I who's can a hear fan it. of that. I can hear it. I can hear and a musical know, but, influence as well, like from from musicals. I can definitely hear that now. You say it like the subject matter is obviously a lot more adult, but it's exactly that same approach. It's like these little philosophies on life in song. Yeah, I was very influenced by musicals, and I'll always be grateful to my parents for taking me to musicals. You know, they took me to a lot of great musicals when I was growing up. Um, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan is sort of the, the godfathers of it. And then, you know, but just stuff, you know, Guys and Dolls and The Music Man and this kind of stuff. That again, most people in rock and roll just be like, that's the square bullshit that we hated. And it's like, well, not me. Anything that's interesting, I like. So... You know, when I was a kid, I, I was in a production of Jesus Christ Superstar. I was in Babes in Arms. I was in Oliver. And I never got a part, you know, because I wasn't the standout good singer or actor or whatever. I was just in the chorus, you know. But but 
it, it, musicals meant a lot to me. Frank Zappa meant a lot to me. Things that were conceptual. And that's why to this day, with the Doors record, I really try and tie it together with different sonic things. I try and have the, the record have some dynamics and move slow to fast and, and you know, sort of busy to, to simple and, you know, they, they have some motion. You know, I, I'll buy it. You'll get a punk band's record, and even if they're good and you like their sound, you know, you get their best song first and then their second best song second, and then it gets progressively worse and every song's pretty much the same. <laughs> and it's like, what? You know, like even when I would do something like that, like Blood, Guts, and Pussy, it was such a short burst of it. Yeah. You know, that whole record is like 12, 13, 14 minutes long or something. So, I mean, it, it, I, I, I just can't take listening to like, you know, here's, you know, here's, you know, an hour and a half of no effects, you know, like, ah, okay. I like no effects. They're great. They're friends of mine. You know, this is like, it's, it, it, you, you, you need that variety. You know, I think I, I was not such a punk fan. You know, again, like I, I, I admire a guy like Fat Mike who loves punk rock so much. It, it's his beginning and end, you know. Yeah. Um. But but for me, it's just like you know, I, I, I my beginning is is you know Scott Joplin, and <laughs> you know, and my end is wherever shit's going this year. You know, I mean, that's just kind of how I do it. You know. Were you one of the first guys to use sampling in a kind of a punk rock context? Because I can't really recall many bands before. What was the last album you did for Sub Pop where you started bringing in a lot of the, the sampling stuff? Uh, there are samples on all the Sub Pop records. The last one was called Sugar Fix. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's samples on all of them. And what's funny is they didn't call them samples. We did them from cassette decks. Yeah, they yeah, start yeah. from our earliest records. Uh, our first EP was The Suburban Nightmare, A Hard Day's Nightmare. 1986 it came out, and it you know it opens with shit off cassette. So what we would do is, this was before samplers were invented or before we knew of the existence of them. So we would just, you know, the tape would be rolling and you'd hit a cassette deck. You'd hit play and hope that it went at the right time. <laughs> you know, I mean, that would, I, I was using, you know found sounds on records from the earliest record you know um and again that's something the doors get no credit for you know i saw a lot of like whoa i saw that guy throw a bottle but i never saw anybody say yeah you know these guys use samples really long before anybody in punk was doing it you know it's kind of you know i mean we weren't the first there's certainly other examples of it but you know we i would have thought somebody would have mentioned it once in a while but you know not it, really. It's funny how much stuff goes unnoticed, and I do think that the longer time goes on, I feel like as a society we're getting lazier and lazier, especially like journalism. Now, like just a news story will be a tweet that they've taken from a celebrity. This person's tweeted this, and like that's the extent of the story, and there's just some like clickbaity, grabby headline that gets people enraged and they never bother to like read the article or investigate further. And I mean, as someone who's, I guess, would you say you are a champion for freedom of speech and challenging the status quo? And if you are, how do you see with the way it's going with this kind of cancel culture trend that seems to be pervading across all the entertainment industries at the moment? As you said, it's like, oh, they'll go back and find something you said either in an interview or on a you know a record from 10 years ago and go, well, we need to reprimand this person now a decade later and you know take their music off the streaming sites or whatever. Like, What do you see as the implications of this climate that we're yeah, in? Like? I, you know, very good point. I think the internet is one of the worst things that ever happened to journalism because as you say, somebody says something and it becomes news, right? I mean, first a right-wing fringe person says some crazy off-the-wall bullshit. Then Trump says, you know, people are saying, and he says it. Yeah. He's not saying that it's true officially, but as soon as he's said it, now it becomes news. Now it gets picked up everywhere. So now we've got this rafts of misinformation that are not true and they've been injected like a poison into the conversation and yeah lazy journalism has a lot to do with it also access chicken shit journalism a lot of journalists now is like they just want to be in the room where it happens right they just want to be have access they just want to be able to call somebody and say hey will you talk to me and so they're not digging up a story because that gets people mad you know, you want to be able to say, gee, you know, I'm 
I'm important. I got to talk to Trump. I got to talk to Mitch McConnell. You know, I, I got to talk to, to you know, uh, Theresa May, whatever it is. And, and it's like, yes, yeah, this chicken shit form of journalism. You know, the cancel stuff, I mean, we talked about that earlier. It, it's very destructive. And, but I think getting back to that point about how we have robbed this younger generation, you know, when you know that you're going to lose, a lot of times you don't try to win. You just try and bring the winner down. And that's a lot of what I see with the cancel culture. It's, it's a generation that's given up on accomplishing anything. So it's like, hey, at least we can tear a bunch of you old fuckers down. You know, we're, we're, we're not going to build a statue to anything good, but we'll tear this statue that we don't like down. And, you know, some of those statues, especially in my country, needed to be tear, torn down. I don't know what the fuck we're doing with Confederates up. That that always pissed me off. So I'm glad they're pulling those down. But now it's gotten to where, like, yeah, let's just pull down every po- every statue of every old white guy. Fuck them, you know. And it's like, well, okay, you're kind of overdoing it, man. We, you know, there is there is a culture that was built, and it does have some value. And and I welcome you to add to that culture. But if all you can do is destroy it. Then I, I, you know, it's like John Lennon said, right? I mean, you know, we all want to change the world, but when you talk about destruction, you count me out. You know, <laughs> I'm I, I'm going to create things, and you can destroy things, and you know, you can try and destroy me, you know, but it ain't going to work. So fuck you. I, th- yeah. I think it's great that the dwarves still stand tall and, you know, are still loved by the people that love you. And I hope that, you know, the more this goes on, the more that bands like you guys will be cherished because so many people do make compromises and concessions, don't they? And as you say, they'll kind of go, oh, we've cleaned up our act now. We're not going to be shocking or provocative anymore because we just want to fit in and go with the trend. And I think it's fucking great that your band continues to, you know stand tall and and there's a few others out there as well i like we mentioned fat mike i like that he's done that very much as well he's kind of been like you know i'm punk rock i'm not going to change i'm not going to apologize this is who i am there's yeah, there's very you know, few of them I, left I was, yeah i i uh look i love fat mike he's an old friend of mine i think he's a great guy and i think he he uh you know but we all make our mistakes his label kind of canceled me a couple of years ago, when, <laughs> right. uh, you know, I, 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 I had made a, a record with them and it did well and people dug it and it was a little seven inch and, you know, we knew we weren't signed to the label, um, but we're old friends and it was like, yeah, we, well, you know, we'll always put out a seven inch by you guys. I offered them a seven inch from, uh, from the last record and, and, uh, you know, he picked out all the songs he wanted. We had it all laid out and then, they chickened out and didn't want to do it. And it was basically like, hey, with all this Me Too stuff, you know, blah, blah. You know, and it was like, whoa. And, and then a couple months later, everybody was canceling Mike. You know what I mean? A cu- couple months later, the exact same thing happened to him on a really big scale because he cracked a joke in, in Vegas and people didn't like the joke he cracked. And, and it was very, you know, the irony didn't escape me. You know, it's like, come on, Mike, you know what's cool. And you know we're old friends. And you bowed to the PC people with me, and now the PC people are coming for you, you know. And they've done the same thing, right? So it, you know, it's very like, uh, you know, I'll always stick up for Mike. I think I think he's great, but he knows he fucked up on that one, and I told him he fucked up on it. I said, hey, man, you you want me to support you, right? When people are tearing you down, but people are tearing me down, you didn't support me. You know what I mean? It's like that's. This is how this game works. But, of course, he's much more famous than me. So the more, you know, in this media landscape, the more famous person wins 100% of the time, whether it's, you know, somebody I like, like like Mike, or whether it's somebody who's a dipshit like Josh or whoever. Whoever has the money to, to hire lots of people and push a hype about themselves, profits, and the people who are real and have integrity is kind of sit around going, gee, I wish things were different, you know, but that, that's how it works, you know? And yeah, I mean, you know, I'm glad that people like you and, and people like Dwarves fans appreciate us hanging on, you know, cause we will not compromise. And when it gets to the point where I, I can't do it, I'll stop, you know? And when it gets to the point where, you know, I, I, I you know, we're not able to have guts and move things forward, we'll stop, you know? 
I've got a couple more things I'd like to pick your brain about before I let you get off, Black, and um, thank you for giving well, One it. thing i got to mention is that I'm working on a solo record that's cool as fuck. I was There's listening to your cr- Candy Now record earlier, man, and yeah. it's fucking so just ethereal and so different to the dwarves and so musical. And who's the girl singing with you on that record, or is it various different women? Yeah, um, so the singer on that record is a woman named Angelina Moisoff. She's originally from Russia, but she's been in America a long time. And I knew her from this great, uh, uh, you know, Bay Area uh, uh, pop, you know, I don't know what to call her, kind of a pop band, kind of a garage band, but very too much too talented to be garage kind of thing. And they were called Persephone's Bees. And basically, you know, it was her and, uh, and, and her husband, Tom. And Tom, aside from being a great friend of mine, is just one of the greatest musicians I know. And basically, he played every note on that Candy Now record for the most part. Uh, he didn't play the drums, but he played, you know, every bass, every acoustic guitar, every electric guitar, a lot of the keyboards. I mean, he's just such an amazing talent, such a great arranger. And so, uh, you know, I had written a song called Take Me to Your Leader about, you know, people from outer space, and they come, and I thought, oh, her Russian accent would be really cool as the, you know, a, you know, per, you know, because it's, you know, from another planet, so from another country, blah, blah. So after we did that song, I got Tom involved with that whole Candy Now thing, and he really helped me create that. I had written the songs, but he really did those arrangements and very much made that record what it was. And then, I, you know, when, the more I heard it, I thought, you know, my voice is kind of blah on some of this. Let's bring in Angelina all over it. And she was such a great singer and still is. Um, and so it's funny that you mentioned that because, I re-teamed with Tom now, you know, it's got to be 12, 13 years later, and we're making my solo record. And uh, Angelina will be on there singing some stuff. And, and nice. uh, you know, but it's like, it's it, very country inflected because my, my voice works with country. And then uh, there's also a little bit of kind of yacht rock on there, softer rock. Stuff Amazing. Things, well, you've got a voice that it, lends itself so well to all of those styles. And it's so great hearing you alongside a female voice as well. It gives it a whole new like angle and, it, you know, just kind of like makes it very rich and dynamic. And I can't wait to hear the yacht rock stuff. That sounds super fun. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think my solo record is going to be very interesting and a departure and it's kind of, it's kind of a style you can get older with comfortably. You know, it's tough. It's tough at my age to do the doors. I have to psych myself up for it because it's like you got to access a lot of anger and youth and screaming and jump in the crowd. And you got to do it. I still love it, but you know, there'll come a point when that's just not feasible anymore. Yeah. And this music is, is very, uh, you know, lends itself more to sort of the real adult me. The other kind of interesting thing that happened, and, you know, I put it out under the name Candy now that the record hasn't come out yet, but I think we're going to put a different name on that because it's so different. Uh, You know, I I hooked up with a producer about 10 years ago, a guy named Andy Carpenter, who's a tremendous talent. I I put him up there with Eric Valentine as just like guys who can mix and record and also write and also sing and also play. They're just these multi-talented kind of guys that you're lucky to meet once in a while. And he had made some really good tracks. And I said, you know, I have some ideas about this. And I sort of turned them from, you know, he makes kind of modern pop tracks. I made them more retro with the instrumentation and brought in uh, Lisa Kekala from the Bell Rays, who is an amazing singer. Uh, And they're, they're, uh, you know, they tour Europe a lot, the Bell Rays. And I would suggest anyone to go see him. I mean, this woman's voice is just out of this world. And so we got together and made a project, and I was calling it Candy Now, and I put a couple of them up up on uh, up online. But I think we're going to give that a name and actually put that out as a record because I don't sing on it, and she's such a unique and great talent. And that's like, yeah, just a very different world from Dwarves music. So, yeah, man, there's some exciting stuff. I, I, I wrote a book. I write a book about every 10 years or so. I finally wrote up the follow up to my last one, Nina. And so, you know, like I, 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 you know, I, I'm just the kind of person that just keeps on pressing on, you know, I, I, I miss the road in some ways, but I'm kind of glad to be the fuck off it. And, you know, I'm just going to make cool records and write cool books and, and 
hopefully work with great people like the Candy Now people, the Persephone's Bees people, the Bell Rays people, and just, you know, try and make cool shit. <laughs> that's, that's the object, you know. You're a modern day renaissance man, Black. You got it all going on. Do you do any broadcasting stuff? Ah, boy, you know, I, I, uh, the last one, there's a great radio guy here, uh, goes by the name No Name. Uh, um, and he, you know, was here on commercial radio in San Francisco for many years as like the afternoon drive time guy. And he and I are friends and we did a, a good show that's up on iTunes. We did it for about a year called, uh, um, uh, we got issues. Basically, we answered listeners' questions. Brilliant. And uh, we <laughs> we did it. It was the two of us, but also we bring in females, so it didn't get to fraternity house. And uh, you know, so there were always female broadcasters on there, and we would uh, answer people's questions. It was like an advice column. So yeah, the kind of cool things that there are, are um, that which is up on iTunes, and then radio like you want which uh, for about three years, me and a guy named Mike, Mike Routier uh, had, a, um, had a cool uh, weekly uh, podcast where we talked to bands. I interviewed a lot of guys from bands and, and played a lot of music. And uh, I think maybe that website is kind of in flux right now. So that might not be accessible right now, but it might still be on iTunes. But I would suggest anyone check that out because I had some very interesting interviews with people. Having the shoe on the other foot is kind of cool. So I, I appreciate someone like you, Matt, that can do a good interview because it's a lot harder than it looks. Oh, you thanks, know man. I mean? it was like I, I went from being the interviewee to trying to interview, and it's, it's, it's a very fine line, you know. So uh, th- thanks so much for giving me the chance to, uh, to talk about what I do, you know. Oh, dude, you're a fucking hero, man, and it's been an absolute pleasure. I've been looking forward to it for ages, and I was holding out to do it in face-to-face person, but I just thought, fuck it, we'll just get on the phone and have a chat, and then, you know, when you're next over here, when the world's back and running again, we can just do a part two and get into loads of other stuff then because, you know, I feel like with people like yourself... I feel like at the end of the conversation, like I've only just started and that's a testament <laughs> to people like you who've just, you know, clearly led such an interesting and rich life, but also just have shit to say about everything. And often that's rare. You know, I interview a lot of comedians and often they're more down to talk about this and that. Whereas with a lot of musicians, it's like, unless it's just about the music or the record, they kind of stumble on words of what, of what to say and, and talk about. But, you know, obviously you're very switched on and engaged with the world. And I think that's, you know, clearly why the, I guess the eternal artist in you is always going to be alive, isn't it? Because you're always, you know, excited by the world and you're always inspired and angered. Well, and... I thank you for listening to me, man. I thank you. I thank the, I thank the people of the UK, you know, they've been supporting us. You know, there, there are places in Europe where the dwarves still can't draw flies, you know, <laughs> I'll tell you what, England has always supported the dwarves, especially London, especially Manchester, especially Bristol and some of the great towns of, you know, Edinburgh and fucking, uh, uh, you know, it, it always, you know, the, the, these places that, that, uh, took us in the rebellion festival, you know, always been kind to us. And, and uh, you know, um, is there, the, I, I just, uh, I love, I love the UK and it, it comes down to a sense of humor. It comes down to, it does. Yeah. It's the, it's the funniest people on earth. You know, you have to be to put up with the fucking food over there, (laughs) but you know, it's like, it's just like, I mean, the funniest people on earth. I love going there and I, I I miss it so much. And, and, uh, we, we shall return. Fuck yeah, dude. The final thing I wanted to ask you is this. So you obviously got motherfucker in me, myself and Irene. Um, was that a Jim Carrey decision? Was that a Farley Brothers decision? Do you know how that came to be in that scene? Because it's so, you know, that character that he plays in that film is so pure Jim Carrey in that scene when he's in the car with Rene Zellweger and he's just going, mama, motherfucker, <laughs> singing along. It's such a great little moment. Like, how did that come about? I'm so proud of that moment. You don't know. Uh, it's incredible. I have to say, the, um, the part that he sings is the only part of that song I wrote because motherfucker is actually written by salt Peter. Who's right, another right. Right. Great, great songwriter and a whole thing. But I, I said, Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we did surfing bird in there? And it was like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a mother, right. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, that's the part that he sings. And, and 
you know, it's such an honor because he's such a great comic and it's, it's a hilarious movie, but it was none of those people. It wasn't the Ferrelli brothers. It wasn't Jim Carrey. What it was, was uh, it, um, there was a very good uh, music supervisor in Hollywood, a guy named Manish Raval, who I don't really know personally, but he's used my music in some things. And, uh, you know, he was uh, responsible for putting together the music for Walk Hard which is such an amazing music film. I love that. And yeah. You don't want no part of this shit, Dewey. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And I think it was Manish Raval who knew uh, about the dwarves. So, you know, let's hope he puts some more dwarf shit in some Hollywood stuff soon. Um, I mean, the music lends itself so well to comedies. Do you have a lot of comics who are fans of your bands? Like, are there any zany, intense, either actors or comedians (laughs) that are down with the dwarves? Because they seem to me that they would be a band that would draw that kind of a crowd in Hollywood. Like, you know, people like the Sean Penns or the... Traditionally, no. Uh, traditionally, no. But just recently, it's funny that you say that because there's a guy, J.T. Haberstadt, who's sort of the punk rock comic, and he always loved the Doors. And he introduced me to some guys like Joe Pepitone and Johnny Taylor and a few guys. And uh, you know, Joe Klosek was a friend of mine. Uh, uh, but a lot of these guys are sort of Bay Area comics or or uh, you know American comics that you might not know. But yeah, I love comedy, and I I you know I wish there was more of that. I think. You know, comics are like a lot of people. They kind of know what's famous, you know, and they riff on what's famous. And the dwarves, you know, it's a little bit more uh, more obscure. Yeah, more niche. Would you ever get into stand-up yourself? Oh, it's so difficult to do. It's so hard to do. Um, it, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think so. I, I think it's more, for me, more writing. I like to write humor. Yeah, uh, write a funny novel or, or, you know, write something that could turn into a screenplay or something like that. You know, stand up. It's not just writing something funny and saying something funny. It's also really your personality. And uh, I just don't know that I could kind of get the crowd on my side. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's very hard to do that. stand up. There's, there's so many things that seem easy. Like hosting a talk show, everybody thinks they could do it. It's like try it sometime. For try it for two minutes and see if you could do it. You know, and that stand up is like that. Very difficult. You know, I'd like to see it, even if it's just <laughs> you as the black, the ripper character, just riffing on that. You know, doing that kind well, yeah, of you know, dice I, clay style. When I, <laughs> yeah, when I do my solo act, there's a lot of comedy in it because I'm just singing funny songs. You know, but I have a prop, I have a guitar that I don't play very well. And I sing my funnier songs and different things, and and uh, that's kind of a comedy act. So I've and I've actually done that in in Britain a few times and had some fun with it. So yeah, you'll see that again. I'll do some uh, I'll do something acoustic and have some fun with it. Right on. Well, listen, mate. Uh, Nick Oliveri was right on the money with you. You're a fucking great guy with a you know a sweetheart. And uh, thank you for giving up your time today and hanging out and having a chat, man. It was really cool. Hey, cheers, Matt, and hello to Charlie Renton. She's my favorite, my favorite British agent, a great, great lady. And props to Rusta Ulrich, my uh, my my British buddy. Props to all of you, man. Stay with it. All right, we'll see you. <laughs> Motherfucker, run, 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 run